Hey math fans, Alex here, and today we're going to take a look at Brownian motion. So the idea is that if you have a particle that's suspended in a medium like water or oxygen, the particle is going to undergo random fluctuations that are called Brownian motion. This was named after the Scottish botanist Robert Brown, who noticed that particles of pollen that he looked at under a microscope when dispersed in water uh, move around kind of randomly. Okay, so this, this process kind of describes that motion. And what we want to know is at time t, where does the particle end up? More specifically, what we want to find ultimately is we want to find the probability that the position of the particle is between a and b. Okay, so we're going to start off by making a couple of definitions. So the first thing that we're going to know, we're going to go ahead and let t be an arbitrary real number, real value time. And then we're going to express t as n times delta t, where delta t, you can kind of think of it as like a time increment. Maybe you're counting in seconds or maybe in milliseconds. But delta t is going to be the time it takes for the particle to move a displacement of delta x. You could think of delta x as maybe like a, a chunk of distance. So in a chunk of time, delta t, you move a chunk of distance, delta x. Maybe in one second, you move one meter. So in two seconds, you only move one meter this way, maybe one meter this way. Then in another second, you might move a meter this way, a meter this way, a meter that way. Okay, so for any time t, you can always express that as n of those displacements delta t. All right, And each displacement delta x is going to be either to the right or to the left. And n is also considered the total number of these displacements, which are Bernoulli trials. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, S sub n can be thought of as the number of successes or the number of displacements, say, to the right, which means that if you take the total minus Sn, that's going to be the number of displacements to the left. So we're going to have two random variables. The first one is a function of time, and it's going to be X sub n of t. That is the position of the particle at time t after n displacements. Okay, so it moves in those chunks, remember? And then after n of those, where does it end up? Well, this is discrete because it can only end up in multiples of delta x. Okay, but perhaps more useful, we want to know x of t, which is just the position of the particle, and that's going to be continuous. Okay, so again, the goal is to de determine the probability that the position is between a and b. How is this related to this function? Well, we're going to note that x of t or xn of t approaches x of t when the time increment delta t gets smaller and smaller. Okay, because then instead of moving in these discrete chunks, it's it's moving a little bit more um, closer to what a continuous random variable would be. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We first need to describe what xn of t even is. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we have is that xn of t as a random variable is going to be what? Well, that's a position or a number of delta x's, a number of displacements. So on the one hand, you're going to move uh, s sub n delta x's to the right. And on the other hand, you're going to move n minus s sub n delta x's to the left. Okay, but I can express that by factoring out the delta x as Sn minus n minus Sn. Okay, and putting all of that together, this is going to get me 2Sn minus n delta x. Okay. And that's going to be useful, and what we have is that Sn has a distribution, right? It's the number of successes, and since you either move to the right or you don't move to the right, and those are identically distributed independent trials, we have that s sub n is actually a binomial variable with n Bernoulli trials and a probability of success p that we're going to go ahead and set equal to uh, one half. So it's like the, the one-dimensional random walk problem where you either move to the left or to the right and, and you don't know what's going to happen. Equal, it's equal probable. All right. Okay, so what we're going to do now is in order to figure out what xn of t is, we're actually going to figure something else out. We're actually going to take another time instead of t, 
and we're going to relate xn of t to um, xn of, say, s, where s is going to be between 0 and t. Okay, so let's, let's formally kind of define what s is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and let little s equal little k delta t's. Okay, where s is going to be a real value time between 0 and t, and k is going to be some sort of integer between 0 and n. Okay, then what we have is we have that I can write xn of t in the following way. I can go ahead and write it as xn of s plus xn of t minus xn of s. Okay, I just, you know, you can cancel these and I, you see that I get the same thing. So all I did was I basically added and subtracted uh, this, this function xn evaluated at time s. Okay. But now we're going to kind of describe what this quantity is. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So recall that since, you know, xn of t was what? It was 2sn minus n, right? And this n goes with the fact that t is n times delta t. So this n goes with the t. Delta x. Then if I evaluate it at a smaller time, well then that means that my number of successes is now s sub k minus k delta x. So what I'm going to have is that if I look at this quantity, I'm going to figure out what that is now. So I have that xn of t minus xn of s is going to equal Well, I can just substitute the values in. Okay, so it's going to be 2sn minus n delta x minus 2s sub k minus k delta x, which when I go ahead and combine everything together is going to get me um, 2sn minus sk minus and minus k, and all that is a number of delta x's. Okay, but let's think about that for a second. This quantity right here represents the number of successes out of n Bernoulli trials. This is the number of successes out of k Bernoulli trials. Okay, so isn't this really the same as the number of successes in n minus k Bernoulli trials. Okay, but then these match, which means actually what I have is that this is equal to two times s sub something minus that something delta x, which by definition is going to be x sub, we always use n to indicate the total number of trials, but now we're gonna plug in n minus k. So xn of uh, t minus xn of s. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this should probably be t minus s. Because t goes with n and s goes with k. Okay. So really, that's, that's a really nice relationship. Okay, we're going to exploit that right now. So what we have is we have that xn of t minus xn of s is equal to xn of the quantity t minus s. What we can say now is I'm going to go ahead and add this xn of s to both sides. And what I'm going to end up with is that xn of t 
is going to equal the sum of two independent random variables. That might not be the most obvious why these are both independent, but just give it some thought, right? Here, what am I plugging in? I'm plugging in time s, and here I'm taking time t, but I'm subtracting off the s. Okay, so think about why those would be independent, but it's very important that they are independent. And I'm actually gonna, gonna note that. Okay, so these are both independent. Okay, so why is it important that they're independent? Well, we're gonna go ahead and try to find the variance of xn of t. All of this is in an attempt to try to figure out xn of t a little bit more, okay? So what we're gonna say is we're gonna define the, the variance of xn of t. We're just gonna define that as a function fn of t. Okay, so we're trying to ultimately figure out what that function is. Okay, if that's true, then we know that since the variance of xn of t is actually equal to the variance of the sum of these two, so it's the sum of xn of s plus xn of t minus s, since the random variables are independent, we can take the variance of a sum as the sum of the variances. So that is the variance of xn of s plus the variance of xn of t minus s. So using this more simplistic notation, we have a functional equation that looks like this. We have that fn of uh, t is equal to fn of s plus fn of t minus s. Or I'm going to go and write it like this. fn of t minus s is equal to fn of t minus fn of s. Okay. Well, this is a functional equation. You've seen a lot of functional equations in this class, actually. This is a functional equation. Uh, it's in the form, I'm just gonna give you kind of a more simplistic way of thinking about it. Maybe f of, say, x minus y equals f of x minus f of y. Now, I'm not going to really solve this out for you, but what I will say is that I'm going to give you an exercise where I walk you through kind of the proof of why this functional equation is about to look like what I'm going to show you. So, which has solution... Um, has solution f of x is going to actually be proportional to x and the constant is going to be f prime evaluated at zero uh, times x. And this is actually assuming f is continuous. Otherwise, there are other functions that can technically satisfy that. Actually, uh, if you know anything about group theory, this would be a group homomorphism uh, in, a, in a way because you can prove that this is actually the same as just putting pluses right here um, since f of x is actually odd. Uh, but the idea is, is the same. So now I'm going to go up and, and really just kind of write this in a better way. So what this is going to be is we can write fn of t, we can write fn of t, which by the way was just the variance of the random variable xn of t, we can write that as some constant 
times t, right? Xn of t, right? It's the, the, the variable itself. Okay. Typically, we don't write it as a constant times t. We actually use a very special constant. So this constant is actually going to be written in the form sigma squared. Okay, where sigma squared has a very special name. This is actually called, this is actually called the diffusion coefficient. And it has to do uh, with properties of the medium that your particle is submersed in. How easily is it to diffuse in say oxygen versus water? Okay, so you can kind of look that up. Um, but yeah, so we have that the variance is equal to sigma squared t. I'm gonna go ahead and box that. Okay, now what are we gonna do with that? Nothing, I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do next. We're gonna find the variance in a different way. So on the other hand, on the other hand, Remember that xn of t was defined to be uh, 2sn minus n delta x. So we can say that the variance of xn of t is equal to the variance of 2s minus n delta x. But this is a constant that can be pulled out of the variance as long as you remember to square it. It's a very important property of variance. Okay, so this is equal to delta x squared times the variance of 2sn minus n. The variance of something plus or minus a constant, well, that constant just goes to zero. And then this two, is also going to come out and this this n we don't really need it anymore so this is going to equal delta x squared times 4 right 2 squared is 4 times the variance of sn but remember that sn was binomial so since sn was binomial with n in the number of Bernoulli trials and p was actually equal to one half, we get that the variance of Sn is npq, which is n times a half times a half, which is a quarter n. So this variance is really the same as just a quarter n, so I can replace that. And then we get delta x squared times four times quarter n. Okay, but clearly the fours cancel and we're left with the fact that on the other hand, the variance of xn of t is equal to n delta x squared, so I'm going to box that. Why is it important that I have two different expressions for the variance? Well, one of the expressions involves delta x, which is a distance, and the other expression is literally proportional to time t. So we're relating displacement and time. Those are very important to connect. So what we have So equating the two variances, we have the expression sigma squared t is equal to n delta x squared, or if I square root both sides, I get sigma square root of t is equal to uh, delta x times the square root of n. You're gonna see why that's important momentarily. 
Let me just scroll back up and let's just remind ourselves of even what the goal was. The goal was to determine this probability. We're going to use the de moivre laplace theorem to relate this discrete probability to this continuous one. But in order to do that, remember de moivre laplace actually related um, Sn star. And Sn star involves variances and all of that fun stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that next. So note that Sn star as a definition was equal to Sn minus the expected value of Sn uh, all divided by the square root of the variance of Sn. But again, Sn is binomial. We know what all of those are. So we get that this is equal to um, Sn minus the expected value of a binomial distribution is Np, where P is one half. Divided by the square root of the variance, but that's going to be the square root of n times p times q. And you can verify for yourself that this is actually just going to equal 2sn minus n uh, divided by the square root of n. That's interesting. Where have we seen that before? Well, isn't that just... Um, the same thing as xn of t, almost. Okay, so, so let's see, if I multiply both sides by the square root of n, I get that sn star times the square root of n is equal to 2sn minus n, okay? But what I can do What I can do is, since xn of t was equal to 2sn minus n delta x, I can go ahead and substitute this expression in, and I get that this is equal to our beloved sn star times the square root of n. And more importantly, the square root of n, let's see, it's 2sn delta, okay, so it's this times delta x. Now, square root of n delta x is equal to sigma times the square root of t. Again, it's useful to express things in terms of t, considering that's what our function is. Okay, so this is equal to sn star times uh, sigma times the square root of t. So I'm going to go ahead and write that here. Oops, I only want to substitute that. So what we have is a situation in which we can now use the de moivre Laplace theorem. So we have that since xn of t is going to approach x of t as the time increment goes to zero, what we have is that, if you'll recall, we fixed a value of time because we want to know the probability of finding that particle in a certain spot at a specific time. Well, that time, which is a constant, by the way, was equal to n times delta t. Now, here's the thing. This was a constant. This is going to zero. So then, what can we say about n? Well, that implies that n has to go to infinity. It's the only way for them to balance it out. I don't know how fast n is going to infinity. That really doesn't matter. But I can finally start to put everything together, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So, we have that the probability. And I'm going to go ahead and say... 
x of t now divided by sigma times the square root of t, right? Because remember, Sn is equal to Xn of t divided by this. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just go ahead and do that. So the probability that this thing is between A and B is actually the limit as delta t approaches zero of the probability that Xn of t over sigma square root of t is between A and B. Okay, but by definition, this thing is equal to Sn star by the way that we defined it. So this is really equal to the limit as delta t approaches zero of the probability that Sn star is between A and B. But hold on a second. Didn't I just say that as delta t goes to zero, n is going to infinity? Right? So we can just straight up use the de Moivre Laplace theorem now and say that this is just going to be equal to the integral from a to b of the PDF of this density function, c squared over 2 dz. And this I will use in a pretty blue color. That is by de Moivre Laplace. Okay, but hang on a second, you might be noticing. This formula doesn't have a t in it at all. Well, that's because in a way, this is actually kind of the standard normal distribution. And the original function x of t was not a normal distribution. But we can go ahead and shift things around. And what we get is that x of t divided by the sigma delta t that is what's called a normalized, it's a normalized random variable. It's a normal random variable that's been normalized. Or I guess you can call it like the, the standard normal. Why? Because the expected value of x of t, and this is something that you can calculate, is zero. What that means is that x of t is just a regular old normal, not standardized, random variable. And now for the conclusion, the conclusion is that now we can say, again, by the Dumov Laplace theorem, that the probability that x of t is between a and b. You're going to have to take a limit. You're going to have to do all that stuff. But what you're going to end up with in the end is you're going to end up with 1 over, and remember, it's the square root of 2 pi, but then you also need the variance in the denominator. So that's going to be, I'll write it as sigma square root of 2 pi, and then I'll put t here. Integral from a to b of e to the minus z squared over 2 sigma squared t dz. Okay, so now we have a formula that actually encapsulates Brownian motion because you have a t in there, which is a constant. Okay, so hopefully that was a good illustration of using the de Moivre Laplace theorem, as well as maybe generalizing the one-dimensional random walk problem to a continuous process. Hope that was helpful and have a great rest of your day.